guys, we're going to get started. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this informational webinar on supporting constituents who are experiencing domestic violence, which is hosted by U.S. Senator Bob Casey's office and the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. We are grateful for everyone taking the time to join the call today. I want to start by introducing myself and the other panelists on the call. My name is Erica Kodawas. I am one of Senator Bob Casey's Constituent Services Spring Interns. From the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence, we are excited to introduce Michelle Cooper. We are grateful for her willingness to join our office for today's webinar. We also have Andrea Guscott, one of Senator Bob Casey's constituent advocates on the call to discuss how constituent services is able to assist. At this time, I'm gonna turn the call over to Michelle to delve more into specifics. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate being here today and having the opportunity to talk with folks about how you can support survivors of domestic violence. Um, I know that this is a topic that comes up a lot um, for, you know, community facing folks and public facing folks, and it can be a little intimidating if somebody is um, is calling or reaching out because they're experiencing this issue. Um, sometimes you can feel like, you know, is there something I need to do or is there something I should be doing? I think most of the time people are especially concerned about what what should I not do? Um, so we're going to talk uh, a little bit about that today, um, a little bit about the dynamics of domestic violence, because there's some aspects of it that um, I think people might not be aware of. And um, most importantly, we're going to wrap up by talking about how you can how you can help, how you can support, and most importantly, how you can get in touch with your local program um, and create a collaboration with them. Um, so just a little bit of background before we get started. Um, my name is Michelle Cooper. Uh, I am the technical assistance and education manager for the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, we provide pass through funding to all 60 of our domestic violence programs. They cover every county in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So there's a different program in, in every county. Some of them cover multiple counties, so there aren't as many programs as there are counties. Um, but the important thing to note is that there is a, a program nearby each and every one of you um, and that serves your community. Um, we provide pass through funding for all of those programs, as well as training, technical assistance and all kinds of other supports um, so that they can do the work of supporting survivors. Also, I have allergies, so I'm sorry if I sound a little snuffly today, um, but we're going to power through it. Um, so if you want to move to the next slide, um, I, I think it's great to start out by just giving everybody an understanding of what does domestic violence look like here in Pennsylvania. Um, so on just one completely average day in September 2021, um, they, they did a poll to see, you know, what does this look like for all of our programs? And the 60 local domestic violence programs in Pennsylvania served 2,214 survivors. Um, this was 1,286 adults and children survivors who found refuge in the emergency shelters, transitional housing, hotels, motels, or other forms of housing through our programs, and 928 non-residential adult and child um, seeking supportive services that include counseling, legal advocacy, and support groups. Um, there were also 625 hotline contacts just on that one day throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and I think that, you know, these little snapshots are important to give us an idea of what this, you know, what this can look like. Now, this doesn't mean that these are the only people that were experiencing domestic violence on that day. That doesn't mean that they were the only people that, um, you know, that were looking for services and didn't know how to connect with them. But this is still a pretty exceptional number if you think about one average day and, and what folks um, are experiencing, looking for, reaching out, and most importantly, the work that our domestic violence programs do each and every day. Um, it's an exceptional amount of work. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, first of all, what is domestic violence? Um, if you want to go to the next slide, we have a great definition of domestic violence. Um, it's a pattern of coerce coercive behavior that's used by one person to gain and maintain power and control over another in an intimate or familial relationship. Um, now, that's a lot to unpack, <laughs> right? Um, but the important, you know, and obviously the important terms here are kind of bolded, 
But I think what folks tend to um, to not always understand about domestic violence, I think I, I always refer to it as people are most familiar with what I refer to as like the, the TV version of domestic violence. Um, you know, the stuff that we see on shows like, um, you know, like Law and Order, um, you know, those things that kind of show us the worst of the worst. We're also familiar with headlines um, when domestic violence shows up in celebrity situations. Those are the most egregious forms of domestic violence. That's typically when things have escalated to physical violence or when there's, um, you know, incredibly um, destructive emotional abuse. But what folks don't always connect is that these are parts of a pattern. So these aren't things that just happen, right? When it winds up on the headlines or, or when it's a glamorized situation that we see on television, that's just part of the story. Um, domestic or intimate partner violence is a pattern of behavior. And that pattern can be any number of tactics that a person uses to gain and maintain power and control. And very often what we see in our work as domestic violence advocates is that there doesn't need to be and often doesn't necessarily include physical violence. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, if you want to flip to the next slide, this is um, the power and control wheel. And if there's anyone in attendance that has done any work with domestic violence programs before, you're probably familiar with this. This is a, a pretty common explanation of what the tactics of abuse can look like. So on the outer rim, you can see that there are these categories that include physical violence, sexual violence. Um, but then in, in the middle, there's all of these different ways that that can manifest. So we're familiar, I think, with the physical stuff, but we're not as, as familiar with the idea of using things like um, children as an abusive tactic. So this can be something that, um, you know, an abusive partner will manipulate children, will say, hey, if you ever leave, I'm going to make sure that I get custody of the children. Um, they can use privilege as a form of power and control using their status or using any kind of privilege that they have. Maybe they're employed and their partner is not to maintain power and control. Um, economic abuse is very common. This is something that um, that we see a lot in our work, especially when we're doing economic justice, we're doing housing work and things like that. Economic abuse is what keeps somebody from really gaining or maintaining any kind of independence. Um, economic abuse is things like preventing somebody from working, um, having an account that their money goes into if they're working that um, you know somebody might not have access to, or even more insidious things like disrupting their employment if they're in a fight, you know, showing up at work, making threatening phone calls, or trying to discredit somebody. Um, so that their employers, you know, don't think that they, you know, should maintain employment anymore. Um, obviously, this list of tactics can go on and on. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just an example. But the reason that I like to start by showing this is because in order to understand how to support survivors, we first have to understand what the reality of domestic violence and abuse looks like, because sometimes without meaning to, um, if somebody discloses that they're, you know, feeling unsafe in their relationship or they think that they might be in an abusive situation, if we don't hear what we're expecting, it might be difficult for us to offer that help and support. If somebody says, you know, I um, know I've never been physically harmed before, but I don't have access to my own money. Um, and, you know, historically, this hasn't been too unusual. Um, you know, if, if there's a, a situation where a couple has all of their money in one bank account, it hasn't been that unusual to hear, oh, you have a bank account and your partner is the one that pays all the bills and does all of that stuff. So we have to be sort of trained to recognize when somebody is saying that they don't feel safe or that they don't have agency or that they don't have control. That is what signifies that there is an unhealthy and potentially abusive situation. Um, our next slide kind of demonstrates that, you know, there's all kinds of different ways and different people who abuse and ways that they use tactics. Those tactics often intersect. 
Um, so the take home point is to remember that this looks very different depending on, you know, the situation and depending on the individual and domestic violence is very nuanced. So every survivor's experience is very unique. What that means for you, if you're interested in trying to figure out how do I support someone or how do I determine if somebody needs to be connected with resources, um, you don't have to. Um, the the role that all of us play in, in supporting survivors isn't trying to determine if anything is happening or trying to figure out, you know, oh, is this abuse or is this not? Um, because these situations are so nuanced and because these tactics are often so insidious and, and they happen in ways that aren't often visible to us, the best and most important thing that we can do to support survivors is to just believe them and trust when they come to us saying, hey, I'm experiencing something and, um, and I'm not sure what to do, that we're able to say, I'm so sorry that's happening to you. Let me see if I can get you connected with some resources and somebody that can help. Um, on our next slide, we, we have some important things to remember. So some key points here. First of all, um, as I've said, you know, domestic violence is experienced, you know, by everyone. Um, it's a nuanced situation and it looks different, but the thing to remember is that it happens to everybody or it can. All gender identities, all backgrounds, all sexual orientations. I know that many times it can be confusing because a lot of our domestic violence programs, which you know came about 50 some years ago, still have titles with women focused in the in the title. So women's center, women's resources, things like that. That's something that we're you know evolving to change and shift. But in the meantime, it's really important for everybody to remember that. Our programs serve everybody. Anyone is entitled and able to access services if they're experiencing any kind of situation that's abusive or unhealthy. Um, and it's not up to you to determine that. It's not up to you to determine if somebody is eligible or ineligible, right? Because um, sometimes we get a little worried about stuff like that. Um, the main thing is that we have to be able to check our own bias and be able to say, you know what? I know that there are services that are available for you and everybody's entitled to access them because this isn't just, you know, we used to kind of frame it as male abuse against women. It had to be a married situation. People had to be cohabitating. And we've really evolved that perspective so much to, um, to understand that this is a dynamic that shows up in, in every possible kind of combination. And it's really important that anybody that's experiencing that situation have access to those resources. Um, next, it's, it's also good to, to kind of remember that abusers are responsible for their choices. Um, this means that we have to remember that no matter what, there's no excuse for abusive behavior. And sometimes even survivors will say, well, it's sort of my fault because I push their buttons or it's, you know, it's only when they're drinking that they get abusive. So as long as they're not drinking, I don't need to worry about it. And we can kind of do the same thing. You know, we can give people a pass or we can say, well, you know, we do some victim blaming in our society from, from time to time. And it's really, really crucial that if we are going to support survivors, that we don't do that, that we don't, that we don't think about, well, is there any reason that this abuse could have been happening that was the survivor's fault, but to hold abusers accountable for their choices and their behavior and to say, you know, no matter what, nobody gets to have that kind of power and control over another person. That is not okay even if it only happens under certain circumstances, even if it only happens in these specific situations, it's still not okay. And abusers need to be accountable for the choices that they make. Um, uh, another key point is that ending a relationship is not always safe and it's not always the desired outcome. And that's a hard one for, for folks to, you know, to kind of wrap their heads around sometimes. If someone's saying, man, I really don't feel safe with my partner. Um, they've been escalating in abusive tactics. I'm worried that they might hurt me. And then to kind of come back and say, you know, I really just wish that they would get some help so they would stop treating me this way instead of saying, I really want to get out of this relationship. Um, ending an abusive relationship is very dangerous. Um, these are when we see the majority of domestic violence related fatalities, um, when physical abuse tactics tend to ramp up. 
So ending a relationship, first of all, you know, even if somebody really wants to leave, it's important that they're connected with supportive services like our domestic violence programs so that they can leave safely. Um, we also know that they may not want that. They may want other supportive services. They may want to hear about counseling or they want to hear about maybe there's some housing that they're entitled to or that they can have access to, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they want to leave. And um, when we hear that, when we receive that information, uh, we can support survivors by just accepting that instead of trying to convince them otherwise. Um, because survivors are the experts, right? They know their situations better than we do. And um, I've seen a lot of supportive situations go south when the person who's trying to offer support starts to try and take control of the situation. Right. And and not only is that not helpful, <laughs> it also mirrors that power and control dynamic. Right. So if someone's coming to you saying, hey, I feel uncomfortable because my relationship includes this unhealthy power dynamic. And then we start to do the same thing by saying, well, you know what you need to do is get out of that relationship and I'm going to give you this information. And if you don't do this, then I don't know if there's anything I can do to help you. It creates that power and control dynamic all over again. And, um, and that is the opposite of supportive. So, you know, when we're thinking about how we can offer that support, even if it's just somebody on the other end, end of a phone call or somebody trying to figure out if there's any services that are available, um, the best thing that we can do is to listen and to be supportive and to say, I'm so sorry that this is happening and to really avoid those um, statements that come from a place of judgment or bias. Um, so I've given you a lot of information about things that you shouldn't do. Now let's talk about what you should, right? Or what you can do. Um, we're going to talk more about each of these things um, in a little bit more detail really quickly, but um, the, the three main things that I always share with folks, especially community partners, so folks that are not, you know, advocates or folks that are um, providing, you know, those next level supportive services, people in healthcare or people, you know, through the civil legal system. If you're just a, a, a community partner, um, the best things that you can do are, first of all, to use a trauma informed and survivor centered approach. So we're going to talk more about what that means if you're not familiar with those terms. Um, but basically, it means just using language and approaching every person that you interact with as though they're experiencing um, trauma, because most of us are, and also because that helps you from waiting for somebody to disclose that they're experiencing something, right? When you use a trauma-informed approach, it means that somebody doesn't even need to say the words, you know, I'm, I'm in an abusive situation because your demeanor and the way that you interact with them already creates a safe enough environment that they don't feel like they need to disclose in order to have access to support. Um, and survivor center just means exactly what we just talked about, making sure that survivors are the focus of whatever interaction. So if somebody does disclose to you, you're making sure to check in with them, offering support that connects with their best interests instead of once again, doing what you think they should do. Um, the other ways that you can help are to connect with your local domestic violence program. We're gonna talk more about how you can actually do that. But when I say connect, I don't just mean having the number and handing it out. It means connecting calling and saying, hey, you know, I, I, you know, I work for this office or I'm in this community facing position and I'd really love to learn more about your program and your services so that I can let people know what you have to offer. Um, and that leads into the last thing here, which is to make a warm referral to supportive services. That means instead of just handing a number out, being able to really, you know, convincingly say, this is a program that I'm familiar with and, you know, here's what you can expect when you connect. So let's talk a little bit more about these things really quickly. Um, when we're talking about a trauma-informed and survivor-centered approach, you can click to the next slide. Um, first of all, some things that you can do are to just ask some of these helpful questions. So something like, what do you need from me right now? Or, you know, if, if you're representing a system or an organization, um, what do you need from, what do you need from this organization? Um, you can also say things like, what are you most concerned about right now? Um, or simply, what do you need today? 
you can see that these questions are giving the survivor the opportunity to take to take control of the conversation. Now, obviously, you're not going to ask these questions, um, you know, out of the blue. But if you are, you know, on a call or if you're meeting with somebody and they disclose to you that they're experiencing domestic violence, they've experienced a sexual assault or any other kind of trauma that somebody might disclose, we can really be tempted to start to leap into fix it mode where we say, oh, oh, you're experiencing this. Well, let's make this phone call and let's do this. And do you know about all of these resources? Um, that can feel really helpful, but when someone's experiencing a trauma and talking out loud about it, maybe sometimes for the first time, that can be super over overwhelming and it might not be what they're looking for. Um, so these are ways that you can ask some questions you can feel connected with someone because you don't want to do nothing. If somebody discloses this to you, it can be intimidating and we can sometimes not know exactly what the right thing is to say. So these are some things that you can ask, you know, I'm so sorry that that's happening. What do you need right now? Is there anything I can do to help you feel more safe or more comfortable while we're talking? Um, or, you know, what do you need from this organization? Um, the next slide gives us a little bit more information about um, trauma informed survivor center. And, you know, what does that look like? So we can click to the next one. And this means, you know, when we're doing the trauma informed survivor centered approaches, some things that we can think about are incorporating an understanding of trauma and its impact. So if you don't know a whole lot about trauma, or if you're not familiar with the dynamics of trauma, how it impacts the brain, behavior, um, even the, you know, physical, um, wellness, try to incorporate an understanding of that. Um, do some training, schedule some time to, you know, to meet with somebody. PCADV offers this training, shameless plug. So do many of your local domestic violence programs. Um, but start to understand a little bit more about trauma and the impact that it can have on folks, because this will give you an automatic ability to approach individuals with that trauma informed demeanor, just understanding, hey, if there's some if someone's standing in front of me and they seem really angry or aggravated, um, maybe it's not because they're a jerk. Maybe it's because they've experienced trauma and they don't need to tell you in order for you to approach them with that kind of empathy and compassion. Um, Another thing to do is to always create opportunities um, or a chance to develop rapport and trust with somebody else. Um, so just always look for ways to, you know, to the questions that I just shared are a great way to do this, letting somebody take control of the conversation and being transparent about what you can and can't do. For many of you, the best and only thing that you can offer is, you know, hey, I'm connected with our local domestic violence program. Can I give you some information or help you get connected? Um, but if you have confidentiality limitations, if you have things that are important for somebody to know about before they start talking with you, it's a really good idea to talk about that. Um, that's a, a way to develop rapport and trust. Hey, I'm really interested in what you're talking about, but I need you to know that because of my confidentiality, you know, limitations. If you disclose anything about child abuse, I am going to have to make a child line report. And I just want you to know about that before we talk any further. Um, another thing that we can do is to provide resources and support. And this means that we just have them out, right? Um, I know that anymore, we don't typically have a lot of like waiting room spaces. A lot of stuff is virtual, but um, just making sure that any resources that you have that can connect somebody to help and support, whether it's domestic violence program, sexual assault, rape crisis hotlines, things like that, that you just have them available somewhere so that folks don't have to disclose in order to have access to them. They're kind of in a space where everybody can access them. Um, and finally, you know, as we've been talking about, just focus on the needs of survivors. You know, if somebody does disclose to you, ask them, what do you need? How can I help you? And if you're doing larger level policy work or, um, you know, work out in the community at a macro level, who's kind of thinking about, you know, how might this impact survivors? How might this policy or this choice or this change impact somebody that's experiencing, you know, violence, trauma, that power and control, control dynamic? And how might we make decisions that are more supportive? Um, so next, we're going to talk really quickly about um, domestic violence programs, right? Because a lot of times for all of you, 
what you can do is connect with a local domestic violence program. So I'm going to talk a little bit more and then I'm going to hand things back over um, to um, to Erica and, and Andrea. But um, I'd love for folks, if you're on your computer, on your lap or on your um, phone, if you go to www.pcadv.org, you'll see a find help tab up at the top. And if you click on the find your local domestic violence program, you'll find um, a really easy to navigate way to find your local program by county, by zip code, and even by proximity. Um, this is a great tool to have at your disposal so that you can determine who your local program is and how to get in touch with them. And it's also a great resource to have on hand if you are talking with somebody who's experiencing domestic violence and they want to get connected to a local domestic violence program. Um, this is especially helpful if you do any sort of um, you know, phone calls or stuff that's more than one county. If your constituents are, you know, kind of cross counties, this is a great way to kind of help them determine what the best program or programs might be to get in touch with because survivors can go anywhere they like. It doesn't need to be within the county that they're in, but because if they have children or custody or any sort of other issues, sometimes it's really helpful to know what is in county first so that they can get connected there. Um, the next slide, if you want to click real quick. This is just some example of what our domestic violence programs offer. So they can always do information and referral to other resources that might be helpful. Things like, you know, rapid rehousing, um, protection from abuse orders, um, even, you know, many of our programs have connections with their local hospitals and medical providers. So they can really help navigate with survivors all of the different things that they might need to connect to in order to, you know, feel safer or to get into a safer situation. Situation. All 20, all hotlines are 24 hours. So there's always going to be somebody that can answer that phone and answer questions or get survivors connected to um, emergency shelter or crisis options. Um, and they also offer, um, you know, some of them offer access to trauma counseling, but there's always some form of supportive counseling that can be available for somebody experiencing domestic violence and safety planning, which I talked about a little bit before. That's the, even if somebody is and interested in leaving yet, still being able to talk to them about how they can maintain safety while they're navigating that abusive situation, and especially if they're preparing to leave. Um, so hopefully you had an opportunity to find your local program. The next slide will give us some suggestions about things that you can do. So like I said earlier, it's not just about knowing the program and being able to share that 800 number. We can also collaborate with domestic violence programs and, and from my position at PCADV, this is what I love to see the most. This is where, you know, you can call and suggest some cross training. So if you're part of an organization or system in the community, it's wonderful when you can call your local domestic violence program and say, hey, I would love to share with all of you what we can do to help support survivors in the community. And we would love to learn more about what you do so that we can really start to create that warm referral network. Um, you can do things like schedule, you know, regular ongoing meetings, or if there's work groups that your domestic violence program would be a good fit for to invite somebody to be at the table. Um, you can also celebrate successes of those collaborations. Um, that's a great community builder is to say like, hey, we're working together with a local domestic violence program to create these resources or to create this um, policy. Um, and then finally, um, warm referral. We've talked about this throughout um, the presentation, but this last slide here will give us some more information about what a warm referral is and why they're so important. Um, you can click through to the next one. And so warm referral or a warm handoff means that you're showing connection. If you have a survivor or a person that's looking for help and resources, you can, you know, give them that real connected handoff 
to say that, hey, this is somebody that I'm familiar with or an organization that I'm familiar with. I've worked with them before. This feels really genuine and supportive as opposed to saying, hey, here's an 800 number. Good luck to you. It really does give survivors, you know, oftentimes you may be nervous to reach out for help to say, hey, you know, I'm connected with this program. They do such great work in the community. Here's what you can expect when you call their hotline, right? This increases the comfort level of survivors, which means that encourages more folks to reach out and, and actually access these supportive services. I don't know if anyone here has had to call a hotline for any reason, but it's really intimidating. And a lot of times in my experience, when I worked on a hotline, people often felt no matter what they were experiencing, like they didn't really rise to the level of needing services from a hotline. So they would apologize and say, I'm so sorry, I know you probably have so many other things that you're dealing with, but I just wanted some information. So it's really important to let folks know it's never going to be a problem, no matter what they're experiencing, no matter what they're dealing with, no situation is, is you know, too big or too small for our programs to want to help with. And when you're able to reassure them in that way, it gives them a little bit more confidence to reach out and actually connect to those supportive services. Um, this last slide here is just um, my contact information. This was just kind of a drop in the bucket um, of, you know, what the reality of this issue is and what you can do to help to support folks, but I hope it was helpful. Um, and if you are interested in getting more information or, you know, if you're trying to connect with your local program and you're having some trouble or you're not really sure what to ask, I encourage you to give me, um, you know, send me an email. Um, let me know. That's my whole job is to help get folks connected to our programs and to help facilitate those collaborations um, and to, you know, to help people learn more about this issue. So I encourage you to reach out if, um, if you have more questions. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand things back over to Erica. And thank you all so much for giving me some time to share. Thank you so much for sharing that important information, Michelle. I am now going to turn the call over to Andrea to provide an overview of how Senator Casey's office may be of assistance um, to constituents who are experiencing domestic abuse and navigating federal resources. Great. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Uh, so Senator Casey's Office of Constituent Services consists of a team of constituent advocates who assist individuals who are experiencing a, an issue with a federal agency. This includes but is not limited to Social Security benefits, missing passports, IRS problems, VA benefits, immigration snags, SBA concerns, and so much more. It's important to note that if we cannot provide assistance, such as with a state or private entity, we can refer constituents to someone who can best help. Go ahead to the next slide. So our office can assist victims through multiple avenues. With regards to social security, we can assist vic victims acquire a new social security number. We can also connect with the VA if a partner or themselves are a service member. In addition, we can help direct victims to resources for health care if they have lost their health insurance, as well as pro provide employment or labor resources. If the victim has dependents, we can help them navigate Social Security benefits for those dependents and assist the victim if an ex-spouse has falsely claimed children on their tax return and help direct victims to the Children's Passport Issuance Alert Program. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, if you would like to request assistance from Senator Casey's Office of Constituent Services um, for an issue with the federal agency, please do not hesitate to contact our office at 717-231-7540 and select option two or toll free at 866-461-9159. You can also reach out via Senator Casey's website at www.senate.gov slash contact slash assistance. Um, if you have any questions regarding the information presented today, please feel free to reach out to Senator Casey's office again at 717-231-7540, option two. Thank you, Erica. We'll now open our Q&A portion. Um, if you have a question um, down at the bottom right hand of your screen, um, there is a Q&A uh, 
button that you can select and then you can type your question in. Um, so we will feel free, we will um, give it just a moment or two for people to ask their questions. Mm -hmm. 